Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Patillo Beals. Chapter 10. At the end of my first exhausting week at Central High, I decided to claim Saturday for my very own. That's why I set my alarm clock for 4 a.m. I wanted a slice of the fresh, still morning all to myself. What I liked most was the absolute silence inside my head and heart. Silence I had not enjoyed for so long. Most of all, I wanted to be alone so I could search for the part of my life that existed before integration, the Melba I was struggling to hold on to. I had always promised myself that I was, wasn't was going to turn on the news, read the newspaper, talk, read, or write about integration. I would listen to records, read my Seventeen and Ebony magazines, and write in my diary. I thought I'd never again be sitting on my bed nestled between my huge white lace pillows and my stuffed animals just like a normal girl. I was trying hard not to face the notion growing inside me that I was no longer normal, no longer like my other friends. Later that morning, when the family sat down together for breakfast, I couldn't believe that Mama was reading the newspaper over the breakfast table, something we were forbidden to do. I see here where the head of the FBI is angry at Fabus for telling lies about the FBI holding those schoolgirls in custody. Mother showed me the Gazette headline and the first part of the article. J. Edgar Hoover angered by Fabus report of FBI. September 28, 1957, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover accused Governor Faubus of Arkansas of disseminating falsehoods by saying FBI agents held teenagers incommunicado for hours of questioning. He's really fired up the segregationist, Grandma said. I shut my mind off. I couldn't listen. Their talk made me queasy. When I couldn't stand it any longer, I had to speak up. We're going to only talk about good things, I said, gulping my last sip of milk. No central high talk. Deal, Grandma said, standing to clear the table. By 10, we all piled into the car and started off for our big adventure. Grandma had offered to buy me a new store-bought dress. I couldn't believe my ears. Then Mama made her announcement. Vince telephoned. He'd ask me if you could go with him to church tomorrow, then out for a bite. I said yes, provided the two of you come home to have dinner with us. Saturday night, we sat watching Wagon Train and the Sid Caesar show on television. And all the while, I couldn't stop thinking about Sunday morning with Vince, especially since we were going to his mother's church. At the same time, I wanted to keep Saturday because it had indeed been my day. Grandma decided we wouldn't answer the phone, so she put it in the cedar chest. Only the shotgun leaning in the corner near her chair reminded me that things were different. When Sunday actually came around, I was in a real dither over my date. I couldn't eat breakfast. Instead, I worked on new hairstyles in front of the mirror. My ponytail was absolutely childish. So I tried an upsweep, a swatch over the eye like Gloria Swanson, and a poof like Elizabeth Taylor. Unfortunately, the ponytail looked best on me. Not knowing how girls were supposed to behave on dates made me nervous. I kept thinking about what to do or say. I thought about the women in novels I'd read and in the true romance magazines and on the soaps. I'd try to behave like them. When Vince arrived, I headed for the living room. Mother stopped me in the hallway and took both my hands in, her, in hers. She held me at her arm's length, looking me over as if she were trying to preserve that moment in her mind. Your first real date, she whispered. I know you are a good girl and I love you. Then I was with Vince. He looked down at me, reaching out to hand me a dozen roses. My first roses, just like in magazines and on Stella Dallas on the radio. Red roses. I whispered my thank you. I saw the clock on the wall and with a sinking heart realized that in 24 hours, it would be Monday morning. I would be going back to school, back to Central High. The date went better than I expected. After a while, I relaxed and stopped worrying so much about what to say and do. The minister at Vince's mother's church mentioned my name and had the congregation say a special prayer for me. I could see by the look on Vince's face that he felt proud to be with me. Even dinner with my family went well until Grandma India mentioned news of Central High. The Mother's League was asking that the 101st be removed from inside the school or at least cut to a bare minimum. Later, I lay in my bed unable to sleep. <clears throat> the joy from my date with Vince was overshadowed by my uncertainty about tomorrow at Central High. 
I tossed and turned all night, worrying that the soldiers would be gone the next day. When I arrived at school on Monday morning, I had only one thought, find Danny and the 101st. He was right there, just as he had been the days before. I kept looking back to see him because I had that nagging feeling he would be leaving all too soon. That evening, I wrote in my diary, a girl smiled at me today. Another gave me directions. Still an another boy whispered the page I should turn to in our textbook. This is going to work. It will take a lot more patience and more strength from me, but it's going to work. It takes more time than I thought, but we're going to have integration in Little Rock. In Little Rock. Guard takes over at school. Arkansas Democrat, Tuesday, October 1st, 1957. I arrived at school Tuesday morning, fully expecting that I would be greeted by the 101st soldiers and escorted to the top of the stairs. Instead, we were left at the curb to fend for ourselves. As we approached the stairs, we were greeted by taunting catcalls and the kind of behavior ex students had not dared to exhibit in the face of the 101st. Where are your pretty little soldier boys today? Someone cried out. You ready to die just to be in this school? Asked another. Squeezing our way through the hostile group gathered at the front door, we were blasted by shouts of, go home, go back to where you belong at every turn. We were faced with more taunts and blows. There were no 101st soldiers at their usual posts along the corridors. And then I saw them. Slouching against the wall were members of the Arkansas National Guard looking on like spectators at sport, sports events, certainly not like men sent to guard our safety. I wanted to turn and run away, but what I thought about was Danny, what Danny had said, warriors survive. I tried to remember his stance, his attitude, and the courage of the 101st on the battlefield. Comparing my tiny challenge with what he must have faced made me feel more confident. I told myself, I could handle whatever the segregationists had in store for me, but I underestimated them. Early that morning, a boy began to taunt me as though he had been assigned the task. First, he greeted me in the hall outside my shorthand class and began pelting me with bottle cap openers, the kind with the sharp claw at the end. He was also a master at walking on my heels. He hurt me until I wanted to scream for help. Not long before the end of the school day, I entered a dimly lit restroom. The three girls standing near the door seemed to ignore me. Their passive, silent, almost pleasant greeting made me uncomfortable. And the more I thought about their attitude, the more it concerned me. At least when students were treating me harshly, I knew what to expect. Once inside the stall, I was even more alarmed at all the movement, the feet shuffling, the voices whispering. It sounded as though more people were entertaining Enter, entering the room. Bombs away, someone shouted above me. I looked up to see a flaming paper and coming right down on me. Girls were leaning over the top of the stalls on either side of me, flaming paper floating down and landing on my hair and shoulders. I jumped up, trying to pull myself together, and at the same time ducked the flames and stomped them out. I brushed the singeing ashes away from my face as I frantically grabbed for the door to open it. Help, I shouted, help! The door wouldn't open. Someone was holding it. Someone strong. Perhaps more than one person. I was trapped. Did you think we were going to let you use our toilets? We'll burn you alive, girl, a voice shouted through the door. There won't be enough of you left to worry about. I felt the kind of panic that stopped me from thinking clearly. My right arm was singed. The flaming wads of paper were coming at me faster and faster. I could feel my chest muscles tightening. I felt as though I would die any moment. The more I yelled for help, the more I inhaled smoke, and the more I coughed. Please, God, help me, I silently implored. I had to hurry. I might not be able to swat the next one and put it out with my hands. Then what? Would my hair catch fire? I had to stop them. I picked up my books and tossed them upward as hard as I could in a blind aim to hit my attackers. I heard a big thud, then a voice cry out in pain, and several people scuffle about. I tossed another, then another book as fast and as hard as I could. One more of their numbers cursed at me. I had hit my target. Let's get out of here, someone shouted, as the group hurried out the door. In a flash, I leapt out of the stall, trying to find my things. I decided I wouldn't even bother reporting my problem. I just wanted to go home. I didn't care that I smelled of smoke or that my blouse was singed. 
Later, when my friends asked what happened, I didn't even bother to explain. The experiment of doing without the 101st had apparently been a fiasco. By the end of the day, more than one of us had heard, had heard talk that the 101st had been brought back. Still, despite all our complaints, there were a few students who tried to reach out to us with smiles or offers to sit at our cafeteria tables. Some even accompanied us along the halls. Each of us noticed, however, that those instances of friendship were shrinking rather than growing. There was no doubt that the hardcore troublemakers were increasing their activities, and without the men of the 101st, they increased a hundredfold. When we arrived at school on Tuesday morning, I noticed right away that there was a different kind of tension, as though everyone was waiting for something awful to happen, only we didn't know what. We had finally heard rumors of a planned student protest, I could see groups of students standing in the hall instead of in classes where they should, would normally have been. Just before first period, more students began walking out of classes. Rumors about a big event reverberated through the school. I could see and feel a new level of restlessness and a deepening sense of hostility. I was on edge waiting for disaster any moment, like dynamite or a group attack, or I didn't know what. They're hanging one, just like we're going to hang you, someone muttered. That's when I learned that some of those who walked out had assembled at the vacant lot at 6th and 16th and Park, across from the school, where they hanged and burned a straw figure. That demonstration set the tone for the, of the day. Belligerent students' protests were firing up the already hostile attitude inside the school. Danny broke the rules by coming closer and talking to me, warning that we had to stay alert no matter what. Near the end of the day, I was walking down a dimly lit hallway with Danny following me when I spotted a boy coming directly toward me on a collision course. I tried to move aside, but he moved with me. I didn't even have time to call for help. The boy flashed a shiny black object in my face. Then suddenly pain in my eyes was so intense, so sharp, I thought I'd die. It was like nothing I'd ever felt before. I couldn't hear or see or feel anything except that throbbing, searing fire centered in my eyes. I heard myself cry out as I let go of everything to clutch at my face. Someone grabbed my ponytail and pulled at me along very fast. So fast I didn't have time to resist. The pain of being dragged along by my hair was almost as intense as that in my eyes. Hands grabbed at my wrist and pried my hands from my face, compelling me to bend over. Then cold, cold liquid was splashed in my eyes. The water felt so good. Oh my God, thank you. The pain was subsiding. Easy girl, easy. You're going to be fine. It was Danny's voice, his hands holding my head and dis dousing my eyes with water. I can't see, I whispered. I can't see. Hold on, you will. Over and over again, the cold water flooded my face. Some of it went in, on into my nose and down the front of my blouse. Bit by bit, I could see the sleeve of Danny's uniform, see the water, see the floor beneath us. The awful pain in my eyes had turned into a bearable sting. My eyes felt dry as though there were a film drawn tight over them. What was that? I don't know, Danny said. Maybe some kind of alkaline or acid. The few drops that got on your blouse faded the color immediately. Hey, let's get you to the office so we can report this. You gotta get to a doctor. No, no, I protested. Why not? School's almost over. I wanna go home right now. Please, please don't make me. I felt tears. I knew he hated me to cry, but the thought of going to the office made me crazy. I couldn't handle some hostile clerk telling me I was making mountains out of molehills. Calm down. You can do what you want to, but no, home right now, I said, cutting Danny off. A short time later, an optometrist explained my eyes and examined my eyes and studied the spots on my blouse. He put some kind of soothing substance into my eyes and covered them with eye patches. As I sat there in the dark, I heard him say, whoever kept that water going in her eyes saved the quality of her eyesight, if not her sight itself. She'll have to wear the patches overnight. She'll have to be medicated for a while. She'll need to wear glasses for all close work. I'd really like to see her wear them all the time. I'll need to see her once a week until we're certain she'll all, she's all right. 
Glasses? All the time, I thought. No boy wants to date a girl with glasses. Despite the doctor's instructions to wear an eye patch for 24 hours, I had to take it off. I couldn't let the reporters see me with the patch because they would question and make a big deal of it. By the time we got home, it was 7 o'clock, and I wasn't very talkative for the waiting reporters. Once inside, I fell into bed, too exhausted to eat dinner. Thank you, God, I whispered. Thank you for saving my eyes. God bless Danny always.